Uh, thanks for having us, um, Jeremy. Yes, over to you. All right. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to host yet another earnings call for the second quarter 2023 for Dollar Financial Services. Um, as customary, we'll just start our earnings call off um, with just a short prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we approach um, to undertake this earnings call, grant us clarity, confidence, and all. Guide our words, our thoughts with grace. May our presentation shine in this space. Grant us wisdom to analyze and to share. Let honesty and integrity be our affair. Bless this call with the success and gain. May our efforts yield fruitful reign. Thank you for your blessings, dear Lord. In your hands, I place this earnings call. Amen. So thanks, thanks again, Jermaine, um, for you know facilitating our earnings call on Learn Grow Invest platform. Um, for this earnings call, we'll be doing things a bit differently. Um, we have on the call today um, different members of our team. Um, um, as we normally do, we have Trevine McKenzie, who is our chief financial officer. We also have our deputy CEO, Ken Rykar, on the call. Um, new guests to our earnings call would be David Henriquez, Aldine Tomlinson, and um, along with the rest of the team. So Aldine is actually the country manager for Dollar Guyana, and David, um, as many might know, is the CEO for Ultra Financier. So in doing things differently for this call, each head, the head of each um, subsidiary will give a first-hand approach, our first-hand feedback to each of the operations of the different segments of the business. So as you can see, that, that will be the approach um, for this call. Right, so just looking back, um, a lot of our shareholders would have participated and would have attended our first annual general meeting, which was held June 1st, um, just a month ago. Um, that was our first um, AGM, went smoothly, and um, you know we managed to pass several resolutions at that AGM and, and of course, get our shareholders up to date in terms of the operations of the business. Um, that also um, helped us to celebrate the first year of being listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. So that's our first anniversary. Um, you know, that's a major, major milestone for us. It feels like we've been listed for five years, even though we've, been, we've, we've just been listed for, for one year. Um, as we continue to keep things moving. I won't get into too much of the highlights because each, um, I know Trevine will get into a lot of the performance highlights and the numbers, but just to touch on the two most important things here are two of the most important things. Um, the loan portfolio, we've exceeded 2.5 billion, we're at 2.6. And uh, as at the six month, um, Ending June 30th, we've hit 232 million in profit before tax. Um, so I think that would have basically shown that we were able to outperform the year, the, the end of year for last year, um, which um, basically is in keeping with our goal of doubling our profits uh, made for this year, year over year. Right. As you all know, you know, dollar is close to the ground, close to the community. Um, we have done a few internal um, appointments. Well, the main appointment that we've done is Ken Roy, who was previously the COO, um, has been promoted to deputy CEO, um, effective July 1st, even though he's been playing much of our deputy CEO role from before. Um, so we'd just like to congr congratulate Ken Roy on his appointment. Um, we've also recently um, done a partnership with the Royal Winchester Hospital Group um, with our MediPay program, which um, allows us to give financing for individuals who need 
funding for um, different types of um, surgical procedures or um, any form of cosmetic or medical um, treatments. All right, so in terms of corporate social responsibility, this is where we are a part of the community a lot more. Um, as you can see, um, we did about um, three CSR um, activities. Um, uh, one of these activities that's close to my heart is actually the fire victim assistance that we did in Westmoreland. Um, as we know, I'm from Westmoreland. Um, a lady living in Westmoreland, her house uh, had some electrical problems and it burned down. And, you know, um, one of our officers, Yannick, um, at the South Branch, um, was aware of the situation, reached out to, you know, our marketing and the team and said that, you know, this is a way of helping somebody that's a part of the community that we um, operate in. So we were able to give some assistance um, to this fire victim um, so that she could, you know, replace some of the, the windows. Um, she started to rebuild. She's been getting assistance from other, you know, corporate entities. So Dollar just played their role um, there. So that, that's very close to our hearts. So that's for two. All right, so we'll move on to um, Dollar Guyana, where Aldine will um, take over. All right, thanks, Kavin. Good morning to our viewers. Thank you all for tuning in to our second quarter earnings call for this year, 2023. Since this is my first time on our earnings call, I'll just take the time to tell the public a little bit about myself. As you know, I am the country manager for Dollar Guyana. I've been in Guyana since we built out our branch and opened our doors to the Guyanese market. But I've actually been with Dollar since 2017, moving through different roles as we grew as a group. One thing I can say about our company is that opportunities are endless and we always look to build value for both our employees and our shareholders. Dollar Guyana was launched in September of 2021. Since then, we managed to grow our loan portfolio the 200 million Guyanese dollars with a customer base of over 600 clients. The portfolio remains diversified with both secured and unsecured loans. Being in a new market, we learn and we understand the risk associated in certain industries. And we decide what sectors we would like to target in order to grow steadily while limiting the amount of risk associated with growth. We offer personal loans to people in both the public and private sectors. Some of these are done through partnerships with other companies that would facilitate salary deduction for their staff. We also offer business loans to Guyanese businesses in sectors such as oil and gas, construction, real estate, manufacturing, haulage, and transportation. In dealing with these individuals and businesses, we have to learn to adapt to the culture and there is a definite change in culture when we talk about Guyana. Um, as you know, it's a similar Caribbean culture, but there are a lot of differences. So we have to modify our operations to ensure we have customer satisfaction while lowering the risk associated with this. In our strategies for growth, we aim for growing steadily not being as aggressive as we would in Jamaica. As you know, Guyana is still a new market to us. Our operations will continue to be centered around our Georgetown branch, where the town's population is a little over 235,000, which is actually about 28% of Guyana's total population, which is a little over 813,000. Guyana is a large company, 215,000 square kilometers, which is about 20 times bigger than that of Jamaica with a much less population count. So this is one factor why we will steadily grow our Georgetown operation and understand the risk associated with growing. Um, and we learn about, more about the environment as we go along. As we grow in a new environment and the loan book increases, we also have to ensure that we keep delinquency and non-performing loans under control. We have done this by hiring an experienced and driven collections team 
And these guys have been doing an exceptional job in recovering outstanding debt, doing repossession of collateral, and developing strategies for dealing with delinquent clients. A trend we noticed and that we would have learned from in the past is that some loans in certain industries don't perform particularly well. One example of these would be the mining industry, where we have had some challenges in, and we have learned from this situation. We learned that the land space in Guyana is a very huge land space, so people can move to far areas, sometimes to the, to the interior jungles, the Amazon rainforests, and the out, outer communities. We have adjusted our approach to these sectors as we notice different trends and we adjudicate differently based on the risks that are associated with this. Dollar Guyana ended Q2 with an NPL of 21% and will be working towards driving our figures down in the months to come as we continue to execute our plans to keep the NPLs low. low. For our plans and what to expect from Dollar Guyana in the future, we will continue to learn about the market and the culture of Guyana and, and we will steadily grow through various salary deduction partnerships that we already have in place and we will foster new relationships for growth in different industries. We will continue to do business loans in sectors that work well for us and we will sustain our operations until we become more comfortable and adept and then that is when we will look to um, look at further expansion. At this time, David Enriquez, CEO of Ultra Financier, he will take over to discuss the performance of Ultra Financier. Thanks very much, Aldine. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here and to our shareholders and to the general public. I uh, just want to thank you all for the amazing support that you guys have given Ultra since our launch. Um, as you know, Ultra was launched in November 2022. And over the last few months, we've had very steady growth. Um, and what we can be really proud of is in May 2023, just seven months after launching or disbursing our first loan, uh, we were able to open our second branch in the city of Montego Bay with our office located at C3 Fairview Office Park in Montego Bay. Um, and we had launched our Kingston office in the middle of January, uh, which is located at Suite 15 Barbican Business Center. Um, our total loan book at the current point at the end of June 2023 is just about $535 million with approximately 30 active clients. Um, this is something for us to be very proud of, um, as we have done this with just a team of three. Uh, our VP of Sales, Mario Brown, who is based in our Montego Bay office, who comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience in this industry, as he's been in it for almost over 15 years now. Um, he's been an amazing asset for us as we maneuver our way uh, to, to further growth. And we also have Daniel Goldsmith, who is our loans officer based in the Kingston office, and myself. Um, we've been very lucky to have uh, an extremely great support system coming from our credit team at Dollar, the accounts team, marketing, legal and compliance. Um, we have received amazing support and also from our board of directors um, led by Kadeem. And so we are, we are really, truly grateful. Our little ultra team is, is truly grateful. Um, in regards to the collateral being held, we have just about $1.15 billion worth of collateral uh, split up amongst blue chip stock, real estate, both urban and rural, and motor vehicles, both private and commercial, which includes you know, fleets of vehicles from, from companies. Um, our entire loan book is... Uh, backed by collateral, as we are a collateral-based um, lending institution. And um, um, we are really proud to boast that our non-performing loans at the end of June is at 0%, which is something that we, we intend to maintain. 
So as um as as Ultra looks forward to the future, our aim is to target around eight hundred and fifty million dollars by year in while maintaining a zero percent NPL. Um, we are focused on this figure, but more important, like, more importantly, we are focused on the quality of loans that we are that we are going to accept and and push forward as cash flow and you know these things are very very important to to our business. Um, we are definitely obviously trying to avoid loans that will will default, etc. So we are really focusing on our quality of loans and not necessarily quantity. Um, in regards to expansion, we are looking forward to regional expansion in 2024 and further growth in our market. So I'll take this opportunity to welcome our deputy CEO, Ken Roy Carr, who has been an absolutely amazing force, not only for the dollar team, but as well as the ultra team. As Kadeen had mentioned, he previously was our head of credit and our COO. Um, and so I also like to take this opportunity to congratulate him um, on his appointment as group deputy CEO and continue to wish him the best of luck in his role. And, you know, I, we're very grateful for you, Kenway. Very, very grateful for you. Thanks. Um, thanks much, David. Um, thanks for that introduction and good morning to our viewers. Um, good morning to our valued shareholders. Um, I am definitely humbled, truly humbled um, by the opportunity given um, in terms of being promoted to the deputy CEO or group deputy CEO of Dollar Financial. Um, the commitment, my commitment and support for this team is unwavering and um, the aim is for us to just be growing and going exponentially quarter over quarter. Um, for this morning, I'll basically be going through some of the highlights um, as it relates to the loan portfolio, as well as just a few operational efficiency uh, metric that we usually um, track on a monthly, I mean, let me say daily, weekly, monthly and quarterly basis, All right? So now as at June, 2023, which have been at the end of quarter, quarter two, um, our loan portfolio represented approximately 92% of the total asset of the company. And of course, consistent with the nature of the business that we do, um, the portfolio remains the primary driver of our revenue and our profitability. And as such, we ensure prudent lending and we consistently monitor um, individual accounts to support the highest loan quality um, possible. When we look at the portfolio in terms of industry concentration, we can see that it remains well diverse. Um, during the quarter, we continue to focus on providing value to customers in um, high growth industry, such as trucking, haulage and transportation. You can see that being at 24%. Um, this sector, um, for the most part, includes our haulage contractors or taxi and tour bus operators. And we also see where real estate and construction, um, which is uh, one of those industries that would have uh, experienced exponential growth over the last few years and still has a lot of tremendous um, potential for growth. So we continue to focus on those industries that um, remain, uh, has a lot of growth potential, basically. Um, when we look at the loan portfolio by segment, um, Dollar Jamaica, now constitute or comprise about 72% of our total portfolio, um, whereas Ultra represents roughly 22%, and the remaining 6% is um, composed of loans from Dollar Guyana. Um, as, we, as we would have heard from David earlier, we see where Ultra has grown exponentially, and we expect and anticipate that this increase will continue, and as time goes by, that portfolio will definitely um, represent a bigger piece of this pie based on the, um, I mean, just the marketing that we're doing and the demand that we're seeing for the services that, are, that Ultra offers. Now, on a quarterly basis, um, we 
would have always, I will continue to share with our shareholders um, the percentage of loans that are secured. And this really is an important indicator and uh, um, gives some insight as to the quality of the loan portfolio. For us, this ratio, um, as I said, gives a good indication of the loans that we can recover um, through asset seizures and liquidation in the event where we would have exhausted all other method or options that we have to collect. As at June, we have seen where this ratio would have increased to 80% um, um, of the portfolio and uh, secured loans for us include loans that are um, collateralized by motor vehicles and uh, properties as well as stocks that are listed on the um, Jamaica Stock Exchange. Our ECL or expected credit loss represented 5% of the loan portfolio as at the end of quarter two. Um, and for those who, who do not know, the expected credit loss is actually a method of accounting that um, bases a loss or, or, or it's a credit risk that is based on the loss that is likely to occur um, on the loan portfolio. So once we book a loan, the, the day that we disburse funds to the customer, there is a loss that is recognized um, on that loan. So in essence, us having a, a large secured loan portfolio, we would have seen that we have managed to keep this, this ratio um, at a manageable level. At 4.5%, this is definitely um, this is definitely low and way, way, um, a way better performance than the industry um, standards. Like the ECL, we have kept our percentage of non-performing loans at a manageable level, um, and that is in single digit and well below the industry average again. As at the end of quarter two, um, this accounted for 9.3% of our total loan portfolio. Um, now this really represents a slight increase over the prior quarter. It's, it's a slight increase over December 2022 and a decrease over the prior quarter. Um, however, I must point out that even at 9.3 percent, we would have uh, um, would have seen where maybe one or two large loans would have been migrated to the over 90 days uh, bucket. But importantly, though, um, we are actively working on collecting due to the fact that the portfolio is so substantially secured. There is a higher probability that we will definitely reduce this, this figure from 9.3% um, over the next several months. And we should see this in by the end of the third quarter and definitely um, by the end of the financial year. Um, in terms of the loan portfolio, um, in terms of the loan portfolio, it should also be noted, or I think it's noteworthy to um, to, to make to to tell you that approximately 81% of the loans that we would have disbursed um, up to quarter two of 2022 2023 um, supports micro and small business um, and and entrepreneurs. And here we are referring to the over 500 taxi drivers that we have converted to taxi owners. We're talking about the farmers that we have assisted in purchasing fertilizers and vehicles to transport their produce. We're talking about the hardware we have assisted with replenishing their stocks. And we're talking about the developers and building contractors that we have assisted during various stages of their development and projects that, we, that they have undertaken. And here we're honoring our commitment to economically empowering our customers, which fosters business productivity and, of course, drives economic growth. In terms of compliance, um, this remains and is an essential aspect of um, dollars operations. Um, with, we treat this as a strategic um, priority, as this is uh, um, a key area that establishes a strong foundation for sustainable and continued growth. Um, we look at this as a key strategy that protects our reputation and uh, definitely mitigate risk and, of course, builds trust um, among you, our shareholders. Since we received our microcredit license in November 
2022, we have implemented several programs and systems that ensure that our operations are in accordance with the Microcredit Act, as well as other requirements from our regulators. Um, this includes, but not limited to um, implementing systems related to um, AML or anti-money laundering, and we would have implemented um, some customer risk assessment screening and um, training programs for our staff members. We're also in the, pro in the process of improving and implementing system to fulfill the requirements of the upcoming Data Protection um, Act or DPA which actually takes effect um, on December 1 or December 1st, 2023, so at the end of this year. All right, and in terms of operations um, or operational efficiency, um, we maintained primary focus on the core pillars of our business during the last quarter. Um, that is prudent lending, which drives revenues. We look at collections, which leads to lower delinquency, lower ECL, and ultimately lower expenses for the company. We continue to focus on compliance, and we continue to build a highly inclusive culture within our organization that fosters um, employee engagement and ensure that productivity is at its um, optimum level. All right, um, at this time, I will hand over to our CFO, who will now dive into all of those figures that I know you, our shareholders, are anxiously waiting on. Trevin. A very big thank you and congratulations to our Deputy CEO, Ken Roy, and a pleasant morning to everyone on the call today. Uh, for the period ended June 30, 2023, we continued on our growth path with increases right across the board. Uh, we would have seen a 98% increase in total income when compared to June 2022. A loan portfolio that increased to $2.6 billion, moving from $1 billion in June 2022, which led to a year-on-year -year increase in profit before tax of just about 76% to $232 million. Uh, we also experienced um, increases in operating expenses and debt, which we will delve into um, shortly. With regards to our main KPIs, um, you would also realize that oh, the health of our portfolio continues to remain strong. And Kenroy did outline this um, just now, with ECL being 4.5%, NPLs at 9.3%, and of course, our efficiency ratio at 47%. Now, in terms of our balance sheet, we experienced a 69% decrease in cash year over year. Now, last year, as you recall, we would have closed out our IPO and we would have had some proceeds retained from the execution, which was reflective in the cash balance at that time. Now, this year, since then, we would have placed a specific amount of cash into financial investments, which you would see on our balance sheet. Uh, we have ramped up sales um, as well as we would have paid dividends, which would have impacted the overall cash balance. Now, our liabilities also saw a year-on-year -year increase of just about 314% to $1.8 billion. Now, in June um, 2022, our largest liability at that time would have been a $200 million bond with GK. And since then, we would have executed on the $1.1 billion bond raise last year, October, November, which would have increased the year-on-year -year debt. Now, other payables also increased, which is really reflective of the growth and the cost of doing business. Now, items that would have led to the significant increase year over year would have been, of course, dividends payable, uh, withholding tax payable, which is mainly associated with our bond, um, audit fees payable, and of course, or usual accrued expenses over the period. Now, none of these items are found to be remarkable in our line of business and are pretty standard um, based on our way of operating. Now, lastly, on the balance sheet um, would be the largest item being the loan book. And of course, Kenwar would have done a deep dive into that. So you don't need to jump any further there. In terms of our comprehensive income, 
the double digit increases are simply due to the lending activity during the period um, with a very small portion of the income coming from interest accrued from financial investments um, mentioned earlier. Now, expenses also increased throughout the period and the main drivers would have been staff costs due to the ramp up of staff required to achieve the strategic goals of the company. Uh, legal and professional fees, which includes costs associated with the stock exchange, dividend payments, um, in this independent assessments, um, etc. And of course, our marketing um, was also a major driver as we continue to increase awareness and to boost customer sentiments. And this includes promotions, campaigns, merchandise and other marketing collaterals. As mentioned previously, our EPS would have increased year over year due to the increase in the weighted average number of stock units issued due to the IPO. So the increase you're seeing on the screen really is also unremarkable given um, that movement in the, in the number of shares. Now, as it relates to our cash flows, um, we are in growth mode and we have been saying that over the course of um, the past few months and simply would have used cash rather than generated cash in our operations. As mentioned earlier, we would have utilized some funds for financial investments as well, which is reflective of the 27 million used in investing. And lastly, we would have also utilized cash in financing, which is explained by the dividend payments over the period. And you will see this being reflective on the, on the cash flow statements. Now, our financial ratios being presented on the screen are within expected ranges. Um, notable was net interest margin. Um, in particular, you would have seen a dip, and this is due to the substantial increase in the loan portfolio over the one-year period. And or debt to capital also, you would have seen a 26% increase, and this is due to the year-on-year -year increase in our interest-bearing liabilities. But as mentioned before, these are within expected ranges based on the, the trajectory of the company. Now, all in all, um, it was a successful quarter and a successful half year. Um, we continue to deliver on the growth strategy and transparency that we have been putting forth um, for the company. Now, I will hand over to Kadeen, or Group CEO, who will discuss further or strategy, strategy as a company. Uh, thank you so much, Ravine, and thank you, team, uh, for your presentations. Um, so in terms of company outlook, I mean, I know that we're going to be going into question and answers, and I'm kind of preempting some of the questions um, that might be um, posed to us. Um, so what to expect from Dollar Financial? We have a list of four things here. Expansion um, through strategy, um, a three-year plan, and future fundraising. Now, um, you might have noticed recently on the JC that the board of directors are considering a dividend payment. I think that will be considered for tomorrow. Now, a common question that I get from sorry, a common question that I get from shareholders um, is, you know, why do we um, pay dividends if we constantly have to raise cash. And I mean, the, the first answer to that is we have to raise capital nonetheless. Um, based on the nature of the business, we'll always have to be raising capital once we want to increase um, the loan portfolio and increase um, once we want to increase the performance. Now, unlike traditional banks um, that are able to use depositors funds to unlend uh, a company like Dollar, we don't have depositors funds. So what we constantly have to do is raise debt or equity. Most times what we do is we raise equity. Um, well, most times what we do is we raise debt. We have exceeded our ability to raise more equity on the junior market currently, um, unless we want to migrate to the main market and lose our tax incentive. Uh, which we don't want to lose. Um, point to note is that when you're a regulated entity by the Bank of Jamaica, 
you pay a higher tax than um, you know your regular corporate tax, which is which is about twenty five percent. Being regulated, you pay a tax of around thirty three point three one third thirty three and a twenty three point thirty three point three percent thereabout. Um, so it's actually a high um, a higher tax bracket being uh, um, regulated um, by the Bank of Jamaica. Um, that also brings me to my second point in terms of uh, um, paying a dividend. Who gets the benefit? Who gets the benefit of the, you know, the tax benefit? Um, so what we do is that we try to give the shareholders the benefit through a dividend, the tax incentive. Because put it this way, if we don't pay a dividend and we were privately held or we're on the main market, we would have been paying 33%. Um, that that's taxed. So now we have the opportunity to save on the taxes from our profits. We prefer to pay that um, out or pass on um, this incentive to all our shareholders. Um, so that kind of just touches on the point of dividend payment and why do we, we, we continuously um, you know, make an effort to pay dividends. Also, the board of directors, they take considerations in paying dividends in terms of where we project it to be in terms of performance and where we are. So if we're out, outperforming what we had forecasted, this shows that there is an excess and the board of directors might take um, this into consideration in, in declaring a dividend. In declaring a dividend, of course, you have to consider a lot of things such as, you know, your available cash. Um, as you might have noticed as well, our cash balance had reduced um, compared to year over year. And this is simply based on the fact that we're, we've been lending the cash that we have, you know, in bank um, so that we can grow the loan portfolio. The good thing about our business is that the term of our loans are normally within 12 months. So if there's a loan for $100,000 over a 12-month 12, 12 period, um, we expect to be getting around 8 to 10% of that collected each month. So for a billion dollars, we're supposed to be collecting 80 to 100 million, you know, in repayments. For a 2 billion loan book, we should be collecting um, closer to 160 to 200 million in loan portfolio, in, in loan repayments. Now, what we are able to do with this loan repayment is to continue to unlend when we receive these loan payments. Now, what's happening is that the demand for loans is greater than the repayments that we are receiving. So in order to meet the loan demand, we continuously have to raise funds so that we can meet the needs of our customers. So I hope that kind of answers some of the some other questions there. So, I mean, that would lead to another question in terms of strategy, in terms of fundraising. Um, are we planning to raise funds in the near future? And the answer is simply yes. Um, based on the demand for loans, um, we will be looking at options to raise um, some form of debt in the near future. The next question might be, how much are we looking to raise? And I think this and this question is, um, we can look at the history of the company to answer this question. Based on the bond that we did last year after the IPO, we raised uh, $1.2 billion and within I'd say three to six months, we were able to prudently unlend um, this money. So if we're looking to go back to the market, it would just be in our best interest to raise a similar amount or a greater amount between 1.5 or 2.5 billion to continue um, on the growth rate that we are on, one, and two, to meet the demand for the loans um, that uh, we currently have. Um, so in terms of what form the debt will take, whether it's a, a bond or a PREF share, I mean, that decision um, after management makes proposals, the, de the decision is, um, as you know, will be made um, by the board. So this is the norm for a growing lending business um, that does not have access to deposit like a traditional lender like the banks. Um, so in terms of the future and what the future is looking like, what we want to do is to develop, a, you know, you hear five in five. We want to develop a three in three plan, um, which we will announce probably in the coming weeks, which will see us setting strategic objectives to hit milestones related to new services um, outside of lending. 
So we're looking at um, some strategic partnerships, some services that we can utilize our net, our branch network to offer different services um, that does not cost us much to implement, but can increase our revenues. So we're looking at um, new services as a part of um, these milestones. Um, we're looking at you know new heights in terms of profitability. Um, based on our run rate now, we can see that we've exceeded 230 million profit um, by um, half year. So I mean, it's it's safe to say that if we continue um, on the same path, that we would be able to be closer to 500 million. So within three years, we want to look at what will be our ambition in terms of profitability um, come say the next three years as well. Another um, another item that we'll be looking at is new markets, of course. We're in Guyana. Um, of course, it's not as easy to open in a new location, open a new location in a country as we normally would have been able to just go to a new jurisdiction, you know, go through the regulatory approvals there. But we now have uh, uh, another barrier to overcome, which is the regulator which is the regulations for um, Jamaica and Bank of America and Bank of Jamaica as well. So we have to um, go over that hurdle when we look at expanding into new markets, but that's definitely something, something that we want to look into for our three in three plan, um, hopefully three new markets. Um, so for the remainder of the year, I'd say the aim is to outperform last year um, with the goal of, you know, doubling our profits year over year and the goal of become, becoming more self-sustainable with a more of a collections approach and a di direct lending um, focus. All right, so um, thanks, Jermaine, um, for being on point with the slides. Um, I try, I try, I try. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna welcome back the team to join us here. Welcome, Trevine. Welcome, David. Welcome, Kenroy, and welcome, Aldine. All right, so what we're gonna do is we have quite a bit of questions. I love that context that you gave us, Kadeen, as to some of the questions that are likely to come up. What we'll do is we'll still acknowledge the question, but if it was answered, we'll just you know move move to the next one. All right. So the first question we have here from Limitless Podcast, any updates on the possible acquisitions that were mentioned previously? Kadeen, you're muted. <laughs> oh, my bad. Sorry about that. Limit, limitless. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I kind of answered the question, right? Um, you know, the demand, if you had cash in hand, what would you do? Um, would you unlend it? Um, and I think the safer thing to do is to unlend the cash that you have. If you have excess cash, you can look at acquisition opportunities. Buying a new company comes with a lot of risk operationally. The loan portfolio, you're not familiar with, you know, the structure um, the leadership. So there's a lot to consider, a lot of due diligence compared to, um, you know, if we have 200 million in bank, do we unlend it or we just go and buy a new company that we have not, not much history on? So in terms of acquisition, I think um, as soon as we can um, complete our next fundraise, um, definitely we have we do have acquisition opportunities in front of us, some of, some of which we might have considered or not, um, but basically as soon as we were liquid enough um, to meet the demands of the current loans that are coming in, uh, whatever excess is there, we'll look at some acquisitions. So you're saying here, Kadeen, that your preference as a company, if you have two choices, right, to acquire or to unlend, you would choose unlending because of just, I guess, the, the fact that that to you may be more stable, more predictable as opposed to now trying to, to integrate a new company into your existing operations. Correct. Especially when you don't have excess capital. Yeah. All right. Let's look at the next one. Neville Graham is asking, well, he's stating your debt to equity ratio is in the three figures. How sustainable is another debt raise in light of this? 
Um, I mean, I'll allow Trevin to answer this question, but based on my limited uh, financial um, <laughs> knowledge, I can say that um, if we borrow a billion dollars, um, that's debt, and that goes on our balance sheet as um, equity cash in bank or loan receivable. Um, so I see that as what that would be like what one to one Trevin. Yeah. Um, so, so basically once the cash that we're borrowing is not going towards operational expenses and we're not looking to blow that money outside of, you know, acquiring assets or, or growing the loan portfolio, um, um, continuing to raise debt should not be a, a problem. It shouldn't yeah. be. And, um, in terms of raising debt, before we do that, we also focus on our forecasts and where the business will go before we we, we enter into new debt arrangements. So we will ensure that we maintain the equity ratio that we would have projected for the company and discussed and agreed with the board. So that's something that is taken into consideration before we enter into new debt raises. Okay. So I have a question here based on what you both just said. So how do you know how much to borrow? So for example, is it that you have clients, for example, for example seeking to borrow up to 500 million do you say let's borrow the 500 million or do you try to have um, a multiple of that? How, how, how is that decision usually made? So it's all based on our forecast. Um, we wouldn't have an idea as to how much a customer will come to borrow tomorrow. And we would have our lending parameters. We would have our forecast in terms of how much we plan to lend. And we would also have an idea as to what our cash flow will look like in the event that we lend such a large amount of money. So before a decision like that is made, we take into account all the variables before unlending those funds to see the impact it will have on cash, on the balance sheet, and on our ratios as well. Okay. So it's managing the risk, essentially. And just to add to Trevin's point, um, it, it's, I always like to break things down very simple. Um, if we have 20 sales officers and they have a target to unlend $50 million per month, I think that's about $300 million per month in loans, right? If you times that by six, that's like $1.8 billion in loans to unlend. So you can see how easily, um, you know, <laughs> just to break it down in terms of the need for cash, breaking it down by just in terms of a sales officer and, and what they're targeting to unlend. A sales officer in South to lend fifty million dollars a month is not a, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a hard task, but it's not it's not an easy task, but it's not a, a hard task either. So, um, that's a way of looking at it when you break it down. Okay. Is that it? Is that some some insight as to the the strategy of of yeah. dollar that he just gave us? You know, there? after our earnings call, sometimes we'll get calls from shareholders to say that we're giving out um, too much of the sauce. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's 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 clearly working, right? Um, Limitless Podcast is asking, how much of an increase have you seen in your business since the new public sector wage compensation? Interesting question. Um, so if you look at, and I think Ken or I can talk on this, if you, if you realize our loan book is, compared to our competitors, when you look at consumer loans versus business loans, our loans would be, Eight out of 10 of our loans is to business loans. Two out of 10 will be to consumer loans. Our competitors are the opposite. They'll be like nine out of 10 of their loans are to consumers and one out of 10 is to a business. So our model, here, here I am giving away some sauce again. <laughs> um, but, but, but what happens is that we're not really affected much by the public sector or um, how do I put it? Persons in a nine to five are, are, are in a job that is public or private sector. Um, we do have specific segments of the industries that we target, but we focus on um, entrepreneurship, micro SME um, mainly. So the, the increase, if we're looking at how it will, it, it will be in our favor because if we mm -hmm. have an SME, um whose customers are you know a, a public uh, a, a teacher for example if we let me break it down again if we have somebody selling putty in lucy and is our customer that person might not be able to buy 
before the race might be able to buy one patty, but now them can buy two patties. So the SME will be doing a lot better by selling more patties, which is good for us because it's an increase in their potential to service the loan for us. Yes. Or maybe they might want to buy a new um, oven because um, they had an increase in demand based on the, the public sector wage increase. So that's how it, it affects our business, but not directly. Okay, makes sense. Next question, any, well, I believe this one was addressed already. The question was, though, any more debt raises planned for this year? If so, what interest rate do you think the loans would be at? I think the last part, maybe you can address um, what potential interest rate do you think you'd have the loan at um, when you raise further debt this year? Oh, well, I think, I mean, our last bond, Trevine can correct me, I think it's like 12, 12% that we had borrowed at. I think that's okay. kind of where the that market is similar, right? No. Yeah, so okay. it'd be around that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can we expect future reports to be released this early? Listen, you guys have set up <laughs> precedence here, right? I've never seen that before in the six years that I've been investing. So you have kind of set yourselves up because I went when I saw this, I was like, you you now put pressure on yourself and every other company to do this in record time. So yeah, I'll, I'll allow well, you to come. I'll say, it. I'll say the pressure is on Trevian <laughs> <laughs> more so than anybody <laughs> else on this call and her team. Um, I think they've, they've done a, I'd like to publicly say that they've done an extraordinary job. Um, it's not easy, you know, getting all of those bank recons for all of those transactions. Um, it takes a lot of work, a lot of overtime. Um, so just want to thank Trevine again uh, for, you know, getting it done in record time. Um, I'm not sure. I, we can't tell you when it will be released, but we'll tell you that it will always be released um, sooner than it's, it's due. Right? Okay. So, um, it, it, it just shows me that you have good systems in place. That, that's what it says, more than anything else. Yeah. I mean, and, that, and, sorry, go ahead. Um, just, just to the, 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 the previous point, um, I think it's, it's Parkinson's law that states that the work ex expands based on the time that's given. Yes. Um, so, so, so if if the stock exchange rule was for your financials to be submitted within 15 days, a lot, a lot more work would have been done to get it done in 15. But if they say you have six months to do it, some people would expand the work to six months. You know, so it's good um, to. Yeah. To, to set a standard for yourself that is higher than one that is, you know, that is given to you. Agreed. Agreed, definitely. Elaine is asking, does dollar have a cap on total borrowing going forward or borrowing or it's or will borrowing be a core part of the business model? I think that's what he was asking. I think for this uh, one, it, it, it's a core part of our business model. And Kadeen did explain that we aren't a deposit-taking institution. So in order to grow, we will need to continue to raise funds. Um, but for us, it's just ensuring that we raise funds prudently. And based on the questions we ask, looking at our ratios to ensure that it is in line with the company's strategy. Okay. So further to Elaine's question, I actually did think about it as it was being presented. At what point? So let's say... 10 years mm -hmm. from now, dollar is doing maybe 20 billion in, in loans, for example. What does that, mm -hmm. does that mean you have to continually just borrow more and more and more to continue to lend? Is that, is, it, 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 it seems it, the only way to go. It, it, it seems, um, so that is the business model. It is the business model, even of the bank, right? A bank has high um, debt to equity ratio. Um, they're, they're lending their deposits, right? Um, so they're highly leveraged. A bank is highly leveraged. They collect the dep depositors' money and they unlend it. And they keep raising their deposits and trying to lend more money, you know? So we're doing no different. We're taking loans and instead of, you know, giving, you know, taking a deposit and giving interest on it. We're taking a loan and giving interest on the loan, you know? So it's kind of like the business model. You can, the business gets to a stage of being self-sustainable in terms of you can meet a particular demand, but if you want to grow and be in different markets and continue to drive growth and not plateau 
in terms of the growth, then you're definitely going to have to continue to raise um, more debt and sometimes equity. Understood. Next question here. What is the appetite for loans in Guyana? Also, which loan type is more in demand? I think that's a question for Aldine. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for that question, Aline. I'd say the appetite for loans in Guyana is definitely there. There's a lot of demand from the general public. We see a lot of walk-in customers' applications coming through our website, dollarfinancial.com. There's a lot of inquiries through our various social media platforms. So the appetite is definitely there. The loan type that we would say is most in demand, we kind of have a balance in both consumer and business loans. Um, our dollar value personal loan is a high demand product. And there's a lot of demand in uh, sectors such as construction, which is um, one thing that is definitely on in Guyana. There's a lot of constructions taking place. I mean, everywhere you see it's a developing country. Um, there's a lot of work being done. So I would say um, in terms of loan type, our dollar value personal loan and our dollar elite loans for areas such as construction. Okay. Mar Simpson is asking, what's the main difference between dollar and ultra? Is it or is it basically a microfinance institution as well? I believe we might have covered this in not just maybe in, in, in the description of the business, but in previous interviews and so on. So Omar, um, if it's okay with you, we did a full interview with, with David explaining the business model of Ultra. I think you'll get great value from that video. Um, but I don't know if there's anything you'd want to drop in there, but I think we've explained that in multiple forums here. If that's okay, for still. All right, I think we're okay moving to the next one. Limitless is asking, how could you, how could the possible placement of, of Jamaica on the Financial Action Task Force blacklist impact your business? Um, well, this, this, this is a big one um, because if, if we, I think we're on a gray list now. I think if we get on the blacklist, um, what this means is that it's very simple. It will affect everything because if we have a business that um, they, they buy supplies from America or from England or they import vehicles, uh, we lend money to a car mart and they bring in vehicles and they have to send a wire to England. Um, the bank going to send back the money and not accept the money. They're going to send a wire to the U.S. and the U.S. going to say this is a high-risk country and we're sending back your wire. And then what, what happens is that you find that there's going to be a significant slowdown in business. Um, we import so much, so it, it will affect everything. So um, this is a big risk um, just on, on everybody. We import food. We import you know everything that we have. Only thing I would I don't I don't even I'm not even sure that what we produce right now is so, so that sugar and some mango and some so so <laughs> it it's it's actually outside of services that we offer and, and export um, it will have a tremendous impact on our business and every other business. Yeah, It'll make it extremely difficult to do business and do it yeah. in the way that we're used to. And the interesting thing is, a lot of persons think that. It's difficult, but being switched um, from gray to being blacklisted will make that even more difficult. So it, it's mm -hmm. definitely going to impact a lot of things. Agreed there. Philip is asking, will you list your current or future bonds on the public bond market? He thinks that's a good idea. Um, Philip, if you can just email your resume to Trevian. We think it seems like you have a lot of good ideas. Um, <laughs> we have the ear to listen. Um, um, but that, 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 in terms of what we'll do in the future um, um, with our current bonds, etc., cetera, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but there might be plans in the future to do something like that. Okay. Steph is asking, as at June, what percentage of net profits does Ultra represent? So we had shown the breakdown in terms of revenue, I believe. What, what does the, the percentage of net profits look like? 
This is about That's 15%. Okay. Yeah. 15%? All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Kamoy is asking, will additional cash be raised to expedite the growth in the Guyana operation? Um, so, I, I mean, I'll answer that, um, Aldean. Um, so, from a strategic level, once we raise cash, what we do is we look at the subsidiaries and we look at the parent company. And then what we do is, based on demand, we'll set a portion, we'll allocate different portions to different subsidiaries and, and of course, the parent company. Um, in terms of what will be allocated, I won't be able to say um, right now. Okay. Philip is asking, does Ultra use all its listed company shares as collateral? If it uses all listed company shares. I don't as think collateral. David uses use all, no. all listed companies. <laughs> No, so I mean, I mean, we 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 do um, ensure that our lending remains prudent, and we we definitely assess the collateral. We look at the historical performance of the stock, um, the value, just some trends that will determine whether the stock price will um, remain constant and things like those before we make a determination as to which stock we'll accept. Okay, but but if if one has dollar shares, then that's okay. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> no questions there. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. TK is asking, how does your net on or non-performing loans ratio compare to your peers? Um, I think I, I'll take that one as well. Um, I think historically, the non-performing loan ratio for microfinance companies have ranged somewhere about 15 to 20%. Um, and uh, I think our business model and, and the fact that we emphasize so much on having... Uh, um, the majority of our portfolio being secured, we have exempted ourselves from that category of high non-performing loan ratio. Our target internally is to be in line with commercial banking standards when it comes to NPL. Okay. One One Coca Investor um, is saying, if we hold dollar in a dividend growth portfolio, can we look forward to a steady increase in dividend each year, like a small 5% per year? I would say... <laughs> Maybe at ten percent. I, I think one one coca. I'll, I'll up you because I'm a I'm a dividend investor myself. So, question over to you, <laughs> Kadeem. So so, um, clarify for me, um, Jermaine. What when they say like a small five percent? They need five percent every year increase. That's a, in... He's he's looking. I, I, it sounds that way to me. Um, or or at least to so a lot of the companies. Mm -hmm. On the market, mm -hmm. I believe range mm -hmm. the ones that pay dividend would range somewhere between one to maybe three percent. To me, that's average. Outliers okay. are typically somewhere between four to eight percent. There are some that right. do higher. So mm -hmm. I, I think he's just saying, you know, if if you were to focus on dollar as a dividend stock, can he, yeah. you know, expect to see that yield growing, you know, each year? Um, it's simple. Once once we continue to outperform whatever we've projected are the goals that, you know, um, the budget that's approved by um, mm -hmm. by the board, then definitely um, we can look forward to the board considering declaring um, dividends. Um, while we're on the junior market as well, and for the tax um, incentive, I think uh, for the next five years and, and the, the, the other five years that we get 50% discount on the taxes, I think the shareholders and everybody would want to you know, get a higher payout in dividend, given that we won't have that tax to pay. Um, so for the next 10 years, I think uh, once we all been well and we're performing, you can expect um, um, the, uh, us to continuously um, pay dividends. Okay, great. Uh, H.E. Palmer is asking, are you guys concerned about the few... Or, uh, about the present trading price of dollar so it's funny um i don't know if you guys read the book in, in intelligent investor um but if you're a long-term investor it's one of my favorite questions right when you buy a stock always buy a stock like you would buy a business all right so if you wouldn't buy that business don't buy the stock um, imagine if I was to get up every morning and watch dollar stock price, you know, when it go up, when it go down, 
when it got up again, when it got down again, you know. Um, so to answer the question directly, we're not concerned about um, the trading price. Matter of fact, well, there's a rule that says when it is you buy low, right, and hold, <laughs> you know. So uh, we're not concerned about the price. We're concerned about the performance and our liquidity and our and our ability and our ability to pay dividends and you know give a return to the shareholders. We believe that markets change. You're going to have an up market, down market. The fact is that once you have a company that is able to sustain and continue its growth over time, um, that you don't have to worry about the stock price. It will correct itself. Yeah. Agreed. I, I think there's only so much that you can control. You can't control the price at which investors choose to trade or sell the company shares. And what you've been doing, which is focused on performance and growth and continuing to you know, expand and be aggressive. That's what you. That's what you can control, and that's what you should continue to focus on. So Neville is asking, how is the unsatisfied demands for loans affecting you? Cash was in mm -hmm. minus territory last quarter, so basically no money to lend except for repayments, as you said. It sounds like you have a, a, a lots of lots of dissatisfied people. Then. Um. It has a very good question, and as you can imagine, um, it's a demand and supply um, issue uh, most of the times. That will continuously happen. Um, you have to manage, or you know, your customer expectations a lot of times, and just be transparent with your customers, and they won't be dissatisfied. Um, so most times, what Kenroy will do, or Aldane or David, you know, is just managing the relationship with customers, managing cash inflows. Trevine will, based on the feedback from Trevine, they'll be able to properly manage cash flow, inflow and outflow um, to then be able to communicate to a customer, you know, when they're able to disperse um, a loan. Um, but it is definitely, we're not going to act like it's not a factor. It is a factor. Um, we, we definitely have to just continuously be raising capital once we want to meet the demand. You know, So if we don't want to meet the demand, because the demand is there, uh, it's not like we created the demand for ourselves. Um, we, we, the, the people love dollar, so then we come to dollar. You know, So we, we try to help as much people as we can. Okay. And, and if I may add to that, Kadeen, I mean, historically, even when we do have high liquidity, we still always have a lag in, uh, we always have demand that we can't fill. <laughs> so, so that's just a part of the nature um, or just a, a part of what we do um, on a daily basis. But on a, on a business side, what that does for us is that if we have 10 loans, it gives us our ability to pick the best two or best three yes. from the 10. Okay. All right. Can we expect any collaboration with providers such as Link to lend digital money? Think Trevian. Yes, I think we can speak to this. We have been in dialogue with Link, not to divulge too much. It's just a matter of going into that new strategic territory that we need to discuss and agree as a team. But definitely we see the trend and we are looking into it and we are making the right connections to do so once it's the right time. Great. All right, uh, H.E. Palmer is asking, how, how equipped is the company regarding digital transformation? Um, I think that we, are, we were ahead of the game when it, when it came to digital transformation. Um, you know, our, our operation, I'd say 90% of our operation is cloud-based, um, both our, from loan management system to our internal systems. Um, we provide digital approaches for customers to reach us. Um, but we still maintain our brick and mortar locations because culturally that seemingly is still very important to our customers. You know, having a, a location in Sav, uh, you know, or, or in Falmouth um, that a customer can really come and sit down and explain what is happening with their business is still important. You know, as much as, you know, we're driving towards digi digital transformation. Okay. Uh, what about a drip system? Uh, this is from one one Coco investor where dollar borrows or dividends using a preference shares format to slowly grow loan books. <laughs> Interesting concept. 
that, that's a very good concept. Um, you know, we've been looking at other options in terms of our next um, debt raise that will, you know, give our current shareholders some form of, if we have 10,000 shareholders and we can say to our shareholders, guys, um, you know, each shareholder, we want you guys to put up twenty to $50,000. That could surely help to fill a, a billion dollar bond. And they know that it's going directly towards, you know, growing the loan portfolio, which will increase their, their dividend, et cetera. So we're, we're somewhat um, on the same track in terms of how do we, you know, integrate our shareholders, that current shareholders, back into whatever debt raise that we're doing. Okay. But that's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Limitless is asking, how does it feel to be the most profitable microfinance company? Are we are most profitable listed. Well, that's uh, that's what he's saying here. Um, oh, well, well, unfortunate for us, as I always say, blinders. We don't know what they're doing. You know, we don't set our standards based on their standards. So we actually don't know what's happening over there, to be honest. Uh, we just know what our goals are. We'll kind of focus on that. But if that is the case, it certainly feels good. You know, just um, being listed one year, celebrating one year anniversary. Can't wait to celebrate 10-year anniversary when we're all gray on this call. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Aline is asking, I believe this is our final question or our second to last question. Dollar is a true example of what a listed, listed company should aim to do. Uh, shareholder engagement, timely reports, social media presence, CEO accessibility and earnings call. So you're saying congratulations to the team. Perfect, perfect. Last um, comment um, in the yeah. Q&A. Thanks a lot, uh, Aline. Al Aliani. Aline. And, and I see Gordon's <laughs> baby in the chat sharing congratulations to the team as well. So a definitely excellent Respect, you know, Gordon. performance and standard that has been set by the dollar team. All right. So I believe we have seen all of our questions. If you have any questions watching the replay, please, please post them in the comments below the video. And we'll be sure to share them with the dollar team. I believe I'll allow Kadeen to say his, his closing remarks as we usually do. I, I thought I said the closing remarks earlier. <laughs> what? <laughs> just just an, an opportunity for us to end on the note of hearing from our... our no problem. CEO. No problem, Jermaine. So, you know, first of all, I, I just want to thank all of our shareholders who took the time out of their day to join us for our earnings call. Um, you know, it's an early morning call most of the times. Um, thanks to all the questions. Um, they've been truly insightful. Um, thanks to all the ideas that we we got as well. We do take the feedback. Um, they're very important to us. Um, um, thanks to Learn, Grow, Invest. And thanks to, you know, the dollar team um, for showing out, um, continuing to be, you know, the background and support, the backbone and supporting me, um, supporting me um, throughout, you know, just trying to lead and, and grow this company. Um, yeah, so once again, thank you all for joining and um, we look forward to have our next earnings call the next quarter. And hopefully we will be able to come through on a lot of the ideas um, that we had mentioned during this call. Hi, I'm Kadeen Mears, CEO of Dollar Financial Services. Dollar was formed to open doors. Our mission is to make getting the money you need a quick and easy process. When life comes at you fast, you can count on us in your time of need. We provide financial services for those with a vision and those on a mission. No matter if it's a business loan or personal loan, small or medium, once you want to grow, we lend. Over the past seven years, Dollar has played a vital role in the microfinance market dispersing more than $3 billion in loans to more than 5,000 Jamaicans. We will continue to play our part in the growth and development of Jamaica and the Caribbean by providing financing support to all entrepreneurs. Whether it's a short-term loan until your next payday or a long-term business loan, visit us at Dollar Financial Services. Remember, we lend, 